Varmt välkomna allihopa, både ni som finns på Zoom och ni som följer oss på Facebook. Det här seminariet arrangeras av fackförbundet DIK och vi organiserar de som jobbar inom kultur, kommunikation och kreativ sektor. Och jag heter Anna Torberg och är förbundsordförande för DIK. Idag ska vi prata om arbetstidsförkortning. Vad är det? Hur funkar det? Är det bara en dröm för de som är lite trötta på jobbet eller är det här faktiskt något som kan vara bra både för arbetstagare och för arbetsgivare? Mitt mål är att vi alla ska vara lite klokare på den här punkten om ungefär 45 minuter. Och om ni har några frågor så skriv dem i chatten så kommer det att plockas upp av mina kollegor och så ska vi se om vi hinner med några av dem på slutet. Uh, and now I will swap over to English because we are very happy to have an international guest with us today uh, that will guide us through this very interesting topic. Uh, so a very, very warm welcome to Professor Brendan Burchill. Thank you ever so much for being here. Thank you. Uh, Professor Burchill, you are a sociologist at the University of Cambridge in England. You have also led the world's largest study of the four day work week. Uh, and it is especially nice that you're here this particular week because we actually had a bank holiday on Monday, which means that we are actually in a four day work week in Sweden this week. And I'm sure there's quite a few of us that have felt that, you know, it's actually quite nice. This is good. It could be like this all the time. And if not four days, at least a few, uh, a few hours less working this week is very, very nice. Uh, When the ex Congress decided a few years ago that we wanted to have a vision of a 35 hour work week, we were a little bit edgy uh, and some people said that we were a little bit naive, maybe, because that could never work. Um, there wasn't that many studies that had been made, but I feel that the discussion has moved on. There has been quite a few studies made around the world um, and we know much more and in large part, thanks to your, uh, your work and your colleagues work. Uh, so I would like to let you come in and tell us a little bit more about the study you have made, because it is immensely interesting. So I, I leave the floor to you. Right. Um, now, I've just gone to share my screen and it says the host has disabled participant screen sharing. So somebody ah, needs then to... we shall immediately fix that. I, they're fixing okay. it here in the background already. <laughs> OK. The wonders of technology. Right. Well, let me start and then tell me when, when that, that is likely to work. Yeah, as Anna says, we've uh, now been uh, doing some experiments on the four day week uh, in, in the UK. And this followed on from experiments in Ireland and United States and other places. And we've got very similar results, but a much bigger trial with much more detail in the UK. And it involved me and my team at Cambridge University and also teams in Ireland, teams from four day week global and the team from the United States. So a big effort. Um, coming together to do this and to yeah challenge that norm that for so long people have said the five day week is people talk about it like it's something that's been here from the beginning of time and will continue as something that's totally naturally given just like day and night um, but of course it's not um, the five day week is something that was created during the industrial revolution before that before we had trade unions pushing for reduced working time It was typical for people to be working six days a week and very long days, often 16 hour shifts. So we have to see that the five day week as being something that's relatively in the history of civilization, a relatively new thing and a transient thing. And one of the puzzles to me is why it's been there for so long. We've had such progress in the last hundred years in terms of the technology, in terms of the education of the workforce. We should have been able to continue working time reduction. And I think now we're about to see a time when working time reduction is, is going to take off again. So I'm now going to uh, share uh, my screen, I hope. And I hope everybody can see that, yeah? Yes, it works fine. Okay, right. So, uh, yeah. So, as I say, this is something I think we have to see as... Um, open to negotiation um, and we've already seen some really good I think European EU a working time directive to limit people working very long hours so it was a very successful uh, uh, 
legislation across Europe, and it really did was effective. All the evidence is it did reduce what we already know is very harmful long working hours. Uh, and um, what now we're thinking is, you know, we need to go beyond this and think about more uh, radical reduction of of working time. Of course, um, well, I would say before. Let me move on again and catch up. There's now, I think, just in the last year or two years, much renewed interest in the four day week um, coming from from different places. Partly there was a pioneering company in New Zealand, Perpetual Guardian, that in about 2017, 2018, started the idea of reducing down to a four day week with a particular model. And that has been, you know, uh, and, and it is the pioneers who did that have now made it their mission to spread what they saw as a very successful, complete restructuring of the way people work from that one company to being a global phenomenon. And that, that's been very successful so far. We also saw a lot of interest in it because you may remember about 10 years ago, lots of social scientists were saying that the we would have mass unemployment. There would be uh, such an explosion in artificial intelligence, big data, robotics, all these things. We just wouldn't need human beings in the same way as we have in the past. And certainly for me and other people, the idea that of having everybody still included in employment, but working shorter hours was a much better scenario than having mass unemployment and large sections of the uh, labor force just told that they weren't needed anymore and you know albeit maybe on some universal benefits but completely excluded from such an important part of society the but even three years ago before the pandemic when I was doing research on at the time looking at how much work you needed to get those psychological benefits from work people saw me as being a utopian a bit of a fantasist a bit of a dreamer thinking about re radical reductions in the working week the pandemic, again, I think has really changed that and people now have a much better imagination of how things could be very different. The You can see here is a newspaper headline from one of the more popular British newspapers. But before the pandemic, when we were looking at how much work you needed in order to get the mental health benefits of work, it turned out that even people working one day a week got enormous benefits compared to people unemployed or out of the labor market for other reasons. So I'm a very strong believer that we should have a labor market that still includes as much of the population as possible, albeit they don't need to work five days a week. So working time reduction, anyone who's been interested in the history of this movement, it goes back a long way, as I say, and this was certainly in the UK, it was the start of a strong unified trade union movement getting rid of those draconian long hours in, at the start of the Industrial Revolution. And it was trade union power that brought that about. And it was opposed by the capitalists of the time, thinking, you know, again, at the time, they were saying this was the end of, you know, we would make ourselves poor, we would stop um, uh, innovation, we would, um, it would slow everything out. Of course, we now look back on that and think the idea of going back to those long working hours would be ridiculous. We also, though, had social theorists who were right about so many things, particularly Keynes, the economist, and Marx, who were predicting very confidently that by, you know, in 100 years time, or by the time of their, their grandchildren, we would already be working much shorter hours, say 15 hours a week. And of course, although they got so many other things right, that was one thing they got wrong. Um, and it seems that that increase in lab labor power trade unions and so on, or the increase in technologies clearly aren't going to automatically bring about a reduction in working time. We needed something else to happen. And maybe this is what's happening now with these new experiments and new data and so many organisations being interested in working, boom to four day week. Why are we interested in this? And again, I think it's, um, there are so many different reasons different people are interested in thinking that moving towards a working time reduction of one sort or another um, would make the world a better place. There's a big environmental case for this through the degrowth movement, thinking that the only way in which we're ever going to meet our targets for climate change are by scaling back on economic growth. And one of the ways to reduce economic growth, they would claim, is to reduce working time. There's also a post-work movement, people who think that employment is fundamentally 
a way of exploiting individuals and we need to do everything we can to remove employment from people's working lives. I'm not part of that movement. That's not what I believe, but that's yeah, they're an in interesting group. The again, there are many other reasons now we're talking about the, the four day week as being a, a way forward, give people more family time so we can be better parents to improve our health and well-being. We know that so much of the illness we see in societies comes from people being overworked and stressed at work. Some people are talking about it's job creation. Again, with this idea that automation is going to happen and uh, we're going to you know, have to do something radical if we're not going to have mass unemployment. I think there's also a strong case for that if we want to further reduce the gender gap in pay and promotions and so on, working time is fundamental to that. Across European countries, we still see, despite all the progress we've made, I think one of the biggest blocks to gender equality in the workplace is the way that women are still doing so much more of the domestic work, the cooking and cleaning and caring, which makes it difficult for them to compete on a level playing field with men in the workplace. So if both men and women have a much reduced working time, I think that uh, could be a big move. Of course, in the past, many women have taken reduced working time by going part time, but that has removed them from the competition for good jobs in a way. And that's why I think it's important that everybody reduces working time, not just those people who opt for part-time work. The, this particular movement starting from New Zealand is very distinctive and different from previous shifts to reduced working time. It's based around working smarter, this smart business model, and in particular, what they call the 180-100 model. So 100% pay, nobody gets a pay cut. 100% productivity, they're aiming that the organization performance should be just as good working four days as it was five days. But there should be a genuine 80% working time. In other words, a 20% reduction in working time. We're not talking about what well, in some countries when people talk about a four-day week, they talk about compressed time, people working four long days, four 10 hour days, for instance, is quite common in the United States. We're not talking about this. The term four day week, it's a nice term, it encapsulates it, but it's, if you like, it's clickbait. What we're really talking about is working time reduction. And it could be by going to four days. It could be by everybody working, uh, finishing earlier in the day. It could be the fact that people have a much reduced working time in the winter, but not in the summer. There's all sorts of different ways. As long as we're aiming for a 20% reduction in working time. So we've been running trials. And of course, many people, before you do something like this, say it's impossible. We know that economists say that even getting a one or 2% increase in productivity is really difficult. And some countries, particularly the UK, has been struggling. We haven't seen that increase in productivity that we've seen, you know, as a norm over the last 100 years and last 10 years for reasons it's difficult to understand it's stalled it's not as high across Europe but particularly the UK so the idea that then we can just suddenly come along and do something that will have a 20 percent increase in, in in people's performance or productivity they thought it's crazy so what do we do this trial and I've been very much involved in the, the research side of it rather than the actual enacting of the trial um in, in the end, it was 60 employers. They were recruited. I mean, the, the, there were adverts for people to take part. We ended up with 60 employers that saw it through. There were up to about 3,000 employees in those companies. They tended to be small and medium-sized companies. The trial went from six months, from June last year to December. The employers were given some consultancy and coaching. They could share ideas and how they were going to bring about this reduction in working time. They were given some uh, some advice built up from other companies that have managed this successfully. The we had the results from that. The, the data we had in December were published very quickly. Normally, academics take hours, take years to um, look at their results and analyze them fully and come out. In this case, time it was really important we got those results out quickly, and they were preliminary results, but they were published um, in. Uh, February of this year, and followed on from the similar smaller trials as had in the US and Ireland. The results were very similar between those those three trials. 
the so what what happened let me give you a quick i'm and i'm whistling through so we have i hope lots of time for questions at the end so forgive me for rushing through when we looked at what people did by and large the the single most common model was organizations where everybody had friday off the working week finished on thursday thursday afternoon thursday evening so everybody in those organizations now had a, a three-day weekend there were other organizations where they needed people there monday to friday so half the people for instance took friday off half people had monday off there were other organizations had different models in some organizations they could stagger the which day people had off so that it was still uh, as many people in as, as possible for five days a week. There were some organizations clearly working different complicated shifts to cover the weekend. Some people working shorter days. Um, and there were some organizations that looked at it on an annual basis, particularly where they were doing very seasonal work so that people would have a lot more time off in the winter and then continue to work their normal hours in the summer. So lots of different ways of doing it. And it was, again, that was interesting to see how many of these organizations that initially typically were very skeptical that they would be able to achieve it found a way of achieving working time reduction and that was successful so not in every organization but we had about 90 percent of the people taking part got a full day off work each week so the working time reduction it wasn't as it wasn't the full 20 percent; it was something a bit less than that but certainly we were talking about serious working time reduction Looking at the outcomes of that, so we had some of the outcomes at the organizational level. And we had big claims there that this was going to increase productivity, reduce absenteeism, reduce turnover. And those things happened in terms of the performance. And here we were measuring it by looking at whatever the organizations themselves considered to be their best metrics of performance, whatever they measured that they had to achieve. And it could be to do with how many things they sold. It could be something that was simply reducible to a, a financial figure, or it could have been to do with the quality of the service, um, whatever. Anyway, we used whatever they used to measure their quality. When we looked at the, that over the start to the end of the trial, it went up, not down, it went up by about 1%, so no change really. We also looked at what was happening in the normally in the, whatever comparison period we could get data for from those companies. Typically, it was the same six month period the previous year. Then we saw a big increase. And I don't know why we got this. And I'm not saying that that is an accurate figure. But then we saw a, over more than 30 percent increase in the performance compared to the previous year. But of course, the previous year, um, the companies were still coming out of the pandemic. And there's lots of things, crazy things going on in this time. You know, we had the war in Ukraine break out. We had this very high inflation. We had all sorts of other things. So it wasn't a perfect time to run a trial. Um, but in terms of the performance, it was good. Absenteeism, really huge reductions in absenteeism um, related to uh, sickness, affected about a two thirds drop, a massive drop in people taking time off work because of sickness and again on turnover it's a six month short term but um yeah clear evidence that a reduced number of employees leaving these organizations they wanted to stay there like what was going on and also organizations that have been struggling to fill their vacancies we have labor shortage particularly with brexit in the uk exaggerating these things um, but they were able to recruit again in a way they hadn't been able to recruit who were struggling to recruit before so at the organizational level they were happy at the individual level, even more clear evidence that the employees were enjoying this thing. When we measured took a lot of measures, he can see a graph saying burnout and a big reduction in a big 70 percent of people saying that they're well, and these are, I must say, you know, this is careful measures we had as good a methodology as we could. We measured these quantitative outcomes at the beginning, the middle and the end of the trial. And when we compare the results from the beginning and end, we get this big re reduction in people's reported burnout. People are sleeping better. Their mental health is better in a number of different measures. Lower anxiety. So clearly a success in terms of employee well-being. How did this come about? The main thing was that suddenly everybody in the organization had such a big reward if they could make it work. And all those people had tolerated inefficiencies in the way they worked. 
suddenly were thinking of how they could do their work and get their work finished in 32 hours rather than 40 hours or whatever their reduction was. Typically, for instance, people had endured long meetings with lots of people there who didn't have to be there. And so radical reduction in meeting time was, was good. The way that people interacted with each other, so they were handing over stuff, became more efficient. Uh, there was much better ways of communicating. People started using technologies that had been there, but they weren't using them for to manage the HR functions, to manage the, um, the, 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 the projects they were doing. All sorts of ways in which organizations could suddenly find big efficiency gains because everybody had so much to gain if it could work. This wouldn't have worked. You couldn't have got the same thing by bringing in outside consultants. A few things just that we were clearly interested in what people were doing in their time off and lots of people doing different things. People could be better carers. People had elderly parents could now go away for three days and look after their parents in a way that was very difficult for them to do when they only had two days. Um, the most common thing we found, and of course, it's only six months and six months is a short period to really change the way you run your life. The, biggest thing we found that people weren't doing different things they were still doing the same things at the weekend they were doing but they were doing them in a much more relaxed fashion they were just enjoying relaxing before now they found weekends were often very hectic trying to get everything done trying to get everything washed and ready for school and work on the monday morning now that now their weekends were just that much more relaxing of course we don't know there may be different things in the longer term interesting again some employers were very interested in what their employees were doing and wanted to make sure they weren't, for instance, drinking more alcohol because they had more leisure time uh, and they wanted them to do um, things that were positive for their family or for their community. Other employers, most employers said, that's not our business. But again, whole interesting thing about uh, who controls working time. Why did the businesses take part? That was one of the things that particularly from Cambridge we were interested in. And there was a whole range of different reasons. Some realized, it was about filling vacancies. They couldn't compete sometimes with bigger organizations in terms of salary, so they could compete in another way. And that's why, and it clearly was, you know, it was a very attractive thing for people to do. In some cases, they were very convinced from the beginning themselves that it wouldn't lead to a reduction in performance. They said in some creative jobs, you can only be creative for so many hours a week. In other organizations, they realized they needed to have a big shakeup, a big restructuring. They hadn't managed to do that regularly that it needed a big shock like giving people this 50 percent increase in their weekends in order to bring that about so lots of different reasons for bringing it about sometimes it was very much a personal project by the owner or the senior management sometimes that was what they wanted for their lives and wanted to share it with other people and sometimes there were real some of these jobs were really difficult jobs you know dealing with children with behavioral problems where working 40 hours a week in that environment would just be very challenging for anybody there were things that we're worried about. It's not all positive. Part of the, in some organizations anyway, in order to bring this about, they needed to monitor performance much more carefully. And that was part of the deal that people were going to be monitored. All of the discussion was about what your performance is. And some people, there were some people didn't like that. In some cases, it was very clearly that this was a gift from the employer and it was conditional. And if people didn't work in this new way of working and achieve their goals, they would go back to a five day week. So it was like a threat hanging over people. In other organizations, it was very much more, you know, more, this is a permanent change. We will as a team make it work together. So different ethoses, but not positive for everybody. At the end of the trial, we asked people if they preferred the staff working at, overwhelming majority of people said they have a strong preference for this four-day week. They loved it. And it was good for me. I've been talking to so many happy people over the trial. I really found it very uplifting myself personally. Not everybody. There are some people who continue to come in and to work on Friday, regardless. You know, they just, it seems some people haven't got anything better to do. Some people, that's their favorite place to be is in the workplace, not with their family, not with their friends. They want to be at work. So not everybody. But the typical overall satisfaction was very high. 91% of the companies are going to continue with it. Some of the others are still thinking about how they're going to uh, tailor it. Some are going to continue on a permanent basis. Some still fine tuning it. For instance, some are saying when you do have a, a, a Monday off, like 
in this week, you can't also add the Friday off, then three days doesn't work. So some fine tuning as well. I'm gonna finish up by giving you some of the political reaction to it. And it's been very overwhelming, the uh, amount of press interest, and it's gone global. We've had reactions from every continent in the world. These stories have been translated. The University of Cambridge website had the most hits ever on this story. Um, and for the private sector trials, and I should have said, by the way, all these organizations taking part were in the private sector. And across, whether they're the right wing or the left wing newspapers, the reaction tends to be very positive. People wanted this. Now we've had surveys saying that, you know, lots of employees think this will become the norm. Employers also thinking this is the way the world is going, that we're going to have the four day week will be a, a normal thing in, in, in maybe in 10 years or uh, whatever. The um, there's some criticism, you know, the trial isn't perfect, the methodology isn't perfect. We need to see what's going to happen in the long term, but overwhelmingly positive at that level. Something different has happened in the UK just in the last week, and that's one of the local government organisations, South Cambridge District Council, has also done its own trial, not that I was involved in, um, but well, I've been talking to them, but they did it. Uh, in a different way, it was a three month trial for local government. And there the reaction has been very, very much more mixed. Again, they've got a lot of very careful measures. Their methodology was was very strong. They brought in outsiders to evaluate what was happening with the employees and at the organizational level. And it was again, the results were very similar. They managed they continue continue the same performance. They could fill vacancies. They actually reduced their costs because they weren't having to pay for expensive agency staff. And some of the newspapers were again reporting it faithfully. There were other newspapers, the more right wing newspapers. And here we very clearly did see a big difference. We're saying this was a terrible thing, that these people were lazy. Uh, we needed to, you know, if we're going to pay taxes, we need people to work seriously and not be idle and only work four days a week. So here we've seen a big political attack, really quite a vicious political attack from the right wing. In terms of from politicians, again, around the world, I think overall the reaction has been quite positive. Even just yesterday, it was announced in Germany. It's going to be uh, debated in Parliament there. In the United States, now we have, I think, six states that we're talking to that um, want to think about how they can bring out working time reduction um, through their own uh, state level legislation. We're seeing public sector organizations coming to wanting to know how hospitals for instance can move to a four-day week because they have real problems with the the staff there and so on I think so politically again the reaction has been uh very positive and I, I really think this is you know it's uh, one of those ideas whose time has come so there you are let me finish there so we have some time for questions um thank you so thank you very much it was very very interesting to to listen to this and also see the very positive results um, we have gotten some questions here, but I will squeeze in a question on my own first. Uh, when I read through your study, I found it very interesting that a lot of uh, the participating employees said that they they wouldn't go back to working five days a week, even if they got a significant pay raise. And some said that it doesn't matter what you pay me, I will never go back to working five days a week. Can you elaborate a little bit about on that? Yeah, I think that was one of the clearest indications that once people have tried, have been given that, you know, an amazing reward, a 50% increase in their weekend time. And when when it was announced to these employees, their reaction was, is this a joke? You know, <laughs> is this a um, some sort of you know, somebody fooling with us? Um, mm -hmm. And so they were amazed when it was actually going to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, again, it didn't come from them. This is It wasn't coming from trade union pressure. This is coming from the bosses, which makes it um, particularly in Anglophone countries, a surprise. And of course, it could work differently in different countries. Mm. But as you say, at the end of the trial, a lot of employees saying they're never going back, even mm. if, you know, whatever pay. So I think it just shows that this is, and that makes me even more confident, this is one of those things that is just going to build up and up. Now we've seen the trial, now with all these newspaper stories, it's out there. People know mm. this is a possibility. And even if people aren't doing it in this way with this 100 80, 100 model, and even if their working time reductions are more modest, mm. I think we're definitely seeing a time now of working time reduction. So, you know, like I say, we've had this period of almost no change in many countries for 40 years, whatever. Now we're going to see a real, I would, this is my prediction, 
we're going to see it so that in a few years time companies are advertising jobs on five day week jobs nobody's going to be applying for those jobs mm. like not the most talented people so companies even the companies that aren't keen on it are going to be forced down this route in order to compete i predict mm. Mm. i have a question here from from one of our viewers um did the companies um uh, think it was was worth to pay the same salary for less work time or is there a risk that salaries over time can go down yeah i think it it would be naive i think to think we'll have no impact on salaries at all and even though to be in the trial we were absolutely clear there should be no pay cap i must say before the trial we were looking at other companies who maybe in the pandemic had to reduce working time that was the only mm. way their business could survive and in some of those cases they did have a reduction albeit a temporary reduction sometimes mm. in salary yeah i think it's possible that the pay rises in those companies that have gone down to a four-day week they're not going to have the big as big a rise as other companies but as you see i think now that people have realize what a gift it is to have more leisure time i think people aren't going to be so worried if there is a small financial penalty to pay and we hope again it's something that difficult to measure but if you're not rushing you know part of the reason why it's so expensive to live is because we're always in a hurry we have to mm. take for instance taxis because we don't have the time to go on public transport so when people are living a less hurried leisure time then they'll realize that you don't need you know you not don't get yourself happy mm. by having lots of money to spend you have you the, the happiness that comes from having time mm -hmm. is much more important mm. oh and the, that that answer also leads me on to another question i got here you're we talking about time and maybe not taking taxes and stuff like that did you see any significant effects on climate or environment uh when people are commuting less they travel less to get to and from work we're certainly hoping that and some of the yeah, the, the data there is very difficult to collect. It's important for us to try and do that. Um, and if, for instance, we found that lots of people were, you know, flying to Stockholm for the weekends to have a, you know, big uh, city break <laughs> parties, then, uh, of course, it's going to have the opposite effect on the climate. For, like I say, so far from what we see, people aren't doing more climate harmful activities in their leisure time. But also, lots of the greenhouse gases come from the from workplaces hmm. and I think by reducing the amount of time that people are spending in the workplace and if it does lead to some sort of slowdown in that continual economic growth then I hope and, and I think it's a reasonable expectation but in terms of getting evidence for it it's it's, it's quite difficult for us to do that we we do have you know evidence what people are doing in there with the time use diet hmm. diaries we're keeping but um more difficult to prove mm. uh we see but might we get many questions here that's good um has there been any comparative studies between the advantages of uh work reduction um time as opposed to flexi time i think when you i think there are i mean again it's not something we haven't done a, a sort of control group where people have had flexible time and sometimes of course the two can go together there's no reason why you can't have both but that's fine mm -hmm. and we know that for many people having flexible times they can adjust their own hours say for instance their children's school hours or something uh a big can be a big advantage to employees at a small cost to employers there's also a danger one if you allow people to choose their own working time then we know historically it's women who are put in a position where they're more forced to prioritize working time over their careers and that's why it's so important i think about the four day week is that it's everybody in the organization is treated equally lots of organizations sometimes say well if women want to reduce their hours they can but then mm. they're no longer considered serious for promotion they're not mm. getting the same pay rises they're not going to be able to accumulate the same pension so mm. i think this idea of it being the same for everyone has disadvantages but also has very significant advantages mm. i guess those problems are also big i mean they're big problems that can not only have one solution this, this could be part but it, it will not magically fix it of course um Indeed. but we can move in the right direction i think that we're moving in the right direction i think <laughs>
Absolutely. Uh, let me see. How 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 do we move forward practically to, towards transforming our lives toward to, to getting a four four week work week? Yeah. How, how the, do we go about it? I think, like I, said, I think people will vote with their feet. I think that's the interesting that you know. I mean, but it happens in different ways in different countries. In some countries, trade unions have been more effective at reducing reductions in working time, particularly say some of the big German trade unions in the 1990s did manage gradual working time reduction. Um, of course, we, in France, we saw it coming from government and maybe not such a successful trial, had some successes, but I think certainly there are some legislation, some changes in legislation that would help introducing it in the public sector. And again, I think we've got trials coming up probably in Wales you know, with our, our current Conservative government in the UK, I can't see them leading on it. But mm. certainly our Green parties and our Labour party, our left-wing parties, are very interested in introducing it in the public sector, where there are big mm. problems they need to overcome. Um, but in this case, I think this idea of diffusing, you know, just people realising this is an amazing thing mm. and wanting it in their organisations. And, and, uh, and, so I think it could be one of those things that just comes about through a, a sort of diffusion process as much as through regulation. Mm. Uh, as I said in the beginning, uh, our union, DEEK, we have a vision for 35 hours work week. Um, can you see from your studies where, where I, as I understood it, it was a little bit more flexible. It wasn't always for four days work a week. It could there could be other solutions too. Um, could you see any difference in the in the results between the companies that chose different ways of going about the work reduction? That's there's a lot of analysis we still need to do. And no, I don't think we haven't done that. But then it would be difficult to do because, like I say, there were fundamentally different types of organisation. Some that are mm client facing and they need to be able to answer their telephones five days a week or seven days mm. a week and there are other organizations that it, they just have to work with each other and they, nobody has to be answering the telephones to outsiders so mm. um in organizations there's one there was one interesting experiment in belgium where an organization that was mainly women were given the choice in that they could leave early or they could take friday off and again it was during the pandemic with schools being closed mm. again it was also different and certainly most people chose having Friday off. That seems to be the favorite choice when people are good. And even people who chose something else quickly mm. realized that having Friday off is the best option. So I think that's, mm. yeah, other things being equal, that's the model that people- Seems to be the, mo with. the most popular model. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But this idea of, like I say, working, you know, if you're in the tourist trade or in agriculture, working much shorter hours in winter, and continuing to work your regular hours in summer that's another really creative solution mm -hmm. again it's such a big reward if you can make it work people suddenly became really creative in how they would go about it mm -hmm. and, it, and just i must say as well you, with trade unions i've been disappointed in the uk that the trade unions they're starting to catch up they're not against a reduced working time but mm -hmm. they haven't been at the forefront of this movement we're having mm -hmm. to approach trade unions rather than trade unions coming to us so that's one thing I think we need to change. And, and maybe trade unions can't move as quickly as other, other organisations mm. in this way. But um, certainly having trade unions there to monitor these things and make sure that we don't get some of the more negative outcomes mm. is going to be really important, I think. Mm. I think we saw um, we have in, in, in Sweden, we have had a lot of problems amongst academics uh, with, you know, high levels of stress and all the health issues that come with that. And we could see during the pandemic, which was, of course, a very hard time in many ways, um, the levels of stress and, and the, the health issues that come with that, they decreased very rapidly. So, so I think we that is a little bit of a wake up call that, you know, we need to think about this differently. Can we do things differently? We can work remotely, but maybe we can also look at how many hours we work a week. Um, then, so that can be, a, I mean, we're supposed to work, uh, you know, we're supposed to work longer and longer, higher and higher up in the ages. And then of course we maybe, we need to look at how are we working during our working life? So we don't yeah. like destroy ourselves along the way just to, to chase Absolutely. the hours i think and there is a case with people living longer and with no pension crises in some countries i'm not against people working longer 
in terms mm. of their, you know, into their late 60s and 70s. But mm. in order to, for people to actively want to do that, we can't have working them so hard. Mm. They're working long hours. You know, so many people are feeling burnt out by the mm. time they get to their 50s. So now I think the idea of working productively, working a shorter week and working longer over the life cycle is an mm. attractive option. Um, I myself worked actually about three years ago now, reduced my hours to 60%. So I'm on a three day week in theory, mm. but it's it's shown me as well. It's very difficult for me to work shorter hours when I'm surrounded by people who are working long hours. And of course, in some organizations like academia, people are competing against each other, wanting to uh, publish more than their, their even colleagues in the same organization. And in mm. some, so again, that would be a problem, I think. If, for this to work, it needs people to feel that they're working as part of a team and employer. And that, mm. you know, and that's normal, but academics aren't always like that. So <laughs> I think there are different different challenges there. But I think it would say, like you said in your presentation also, that it would be a way for employers to, to compete for talent. They might not always be able to give super like the biggest salaries but they can give you this benefit of of being able to balance work and life a little bit better um time flies uh this has been very very interesting and we're going to continue to follow your your work and see what's happening because this is a, a very very important development and i think we will have to discuss this a lot uh going forward so thank you very much professor Birchell. Uh, and I will now swap over to Swedish. Så om jag kan göra det. Tack så hemskt mycket till alla er som har följt det här samtalet. Det har kommit in många frågor och vi har försökt besvara så många som möjligt. Men som jag precis sa så är det här ett samtal som jag tror kommer att fortsätta. Vi får in, det kommer fler och fler studier, det kommer in fler och fler faktiska resultat på hur det skulle kunna funka att reducera hur många timmar och dagar vi jobbar i veckan. Så jag tänker så här, vi kommer att fortsätta det här samtalet på alla möjliga olika sätt i alla de fackliga rum som vi träffas i, eh, i vanliga fall. Eh, och så tänker jag att vi ska pusha den här frågan framåt. Så stort tack för att ni har ägnat de här 45 minuterna med oss och tack så mycket. Så, nu ska vi se. Just hang on here a little bit while we're closing down. <laughs> yeah, I'm just reading some of the comments. Yeah, lots of interesting questions there. Uh, yes, yeah, so we'll um, try to, to um, save them and, and bring them forward because I think we will discuss this a lot forward. Yeah. Um, if you could, if it's possible for you to save those comments and uh, absolutely, we will do file. that. Uh, I will also that. ask you now: uh, Is there any possibility that we can get the presentation from you that you the, you gave us the PowerPoint presentation? Yeah, sure, I can send that to you. Yeah, perfect. Thank you very much. Yeah, and we can make that uh, accessible for the participants. Yeah, and there's lots of other um, material on the web. There's the report you've read. Uh, the Cambridge University website is very accessible on this subject. I've just got a video on it, that uh, just a short five minute video that is going to be released next week. So I'll, I'll send you copies of that as well. Perfect. Yeah. Just see. But thank you so much. And okay. we look forward to getting the presentation and we will make sure that you get the questions that have come in. Uh, okay. Thank, thank you. you. Right. Thank you touch. so much. <laughs> okay, I will. Right. I will. Bye bye. bye.